Hello everyone, Dominic here from Esports News UK. Thank you very much for being here, bringing Worlds to London again. Um, my question to you is about the LEC Roadshow next year. It was announced that's going on the road. Of course, here in the UK, we have Fnatic, we have Giant X. So my question to you is, um, you know, what kind of possibility would there be of uh, a roadshow event here in the UK? Because we've had MSI, we've had Worlds, but we're greedy, we want more. <laughs> and that's a question to John or whoever would like to answer that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Can, I can jump on that one. And I, I want to be careful because the entire LEC team is sitting up in the balcony. So <laughs> I don't want anything to come flying over the side and, and hit me in the head. Um, I think generally all of our regional teams and the LEC team specifically are constantly looking at what markets make the most sense in any given year to take a roadshow to, and that's based on uh, fan base kind of last time we were there uh, and a number of other kind of business pieces that fit together. I know that team is actively looking across all of Europe, including uh, London and the UK in general, uh, to bring events to. I don't think there are any specific plans that they're ready to announce or ready for me to announce in their stead, uh, but they're, they're constantly looking at those possibilities. Well, it's a very non-answer answer, but, but it's, a, it's a really solid maybe. Uh, we'll wait for the translation for a second. I think. I'm not actually sure. I think we are. Hello, everyone. My name is Eduardo from Base Rush, Brazil. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My question goes to Chris or John. I don't know if the, who is the proper one to, to answer that. But and with a new tournament on the annual calendar, is on the riot rather to host one of those three major tournaments in other minor regions, as for example, Brazil or South America in general? I, I can answer that too. First of all, I love your jacket. Uh, I think that. Uh, one of the things you'll find with First Stand is that it does give us an opportunity to go to markets that we may not regularly be bringing MSI and Worlds to. Uh, Lal Park in, in Korea was a great place for us to start, especially uh, we tend to plan events out years in advance. So as we worked on First Stand this year, being able to turn to a very, very talented group of folks at Lal Park to pull the event off for the first year made a lot of sense to us. But as we go forward in, in future years, we will be looking to go to markets with that event specifically, including markets like South America and Southeast Asia, where we may not have taken a, an international event in, in quite some time. So uh, we'll have more announcements about the future roadmap uh, sometime in December or January when we do our like, start of season announcements. But uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about the plans for first stand at that point. But yeah, I think we're, we're thinking along the same, same lines you are. Hi everyone, Sean Wetzler for the Score Esports. Very happy to hear we're gonna get an event in Canada. That's exciting. Um, Chris, you said in your opening remarks that there's going to be this new revenue pool which will provide more revenue opportunities for pro teams in 2025. Could you just share some details about how the approach next year is going to differ from previous years and are there any lessons from previous revenue sharing efforts like the team logos and um, such that have been in the game that you're bringing forward into the approach for next season? Yeah, sure. So uh, in most of our, uh, most of our leagues, where, especially the ones where we had uh, long-term partnerships like North America, Europe, and, and Korea, uh, we had uh, a revenue share that revolved around sponsorships and media rights. Um, that was a great plan when we, when we pulled it together you know, for the, the first league in 2018. Um, but I think the market has evolved a lot since then. Uh, and it's, it, we've realized that it's a lot more volatile, the sponsorship and media market, than maybe we first thought. Uh, it also doesn't perfectly align team interest with, with our interests. Like often we were in the market selling, you know, talking to partners, uh, almost in competition with each other. Uh, being able to focus on digital goods allows us to better align with teams so that we're all out kind of talking to fans in, in the same way. Uh, and it creates this really unified vision for us in teams uh, and with the game team as well to create things that, are, that deliver a lot of player value and also help push fandom forward uh, in esports. So 
I think uh, we really started down the road last year with the season kickoff event. Uh, the winning teams from, from all of those regions worked with us to create emotes. Um, we kind of took the learnings from that into the global emotes program this year, uh, and we're able to expand it to all of our tier one leagues. Uh, and we're gonna take a lot of those learnings into next year. Uh, we'll take some of our existing uh, revenue share from uh, the skins that are sold around uh, uh, First Stand, MSI, and Worlds, uh, the world's winner skins and Hall of Legends, and be able to put those together with, you know, kind of a anything else we were able to release and kind of work through over the next couple of years. Thank you. Yeah. Um, may I remind the, both the journalists and the executives Sorry. to keep the questions relatively short or concise, as well as the answers. Um, it was David who said that you speak too long, Chris. It, it wasn't me. No, okay, I'm just so you know. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, Sorry. I don't think we're holding up. So, go ahead, Travis. Hey, it's Travis. Uh, so, first question is for Paul, quick question. What are the chances that Riot will release a sequel to The Misadventures of PB Winterbottom? Uh, hi, hi, Travis, nice to see you. Uh, highly doubtful. Uh, <laughs> 2K owns the IP, but if they ever wanted to make a sequel, I would play that game. Uh, so, thank you for your question, though. Cool. <laughs> Pausing for translation. <laughs> So uh, the real question is to John. Uh, we were just talking about digital goods. Uh, what percentage do you see the sponsorship revenue versus other revenues versus digital revenues becoming for uh, Riot Esports? Because it sounds like now there's a pretty big move towards digital goods as the primary revenue model. So how do you see that sitting alongside sponsorships, especially as a percentage pool? Yeah. So over the past few years, coming out of the pandemic, the sponsorship market uh, weakened generally um, with a lot of uncertainties around the economy and just you know, generally uncertainty about how the economy was going to react coming out of the pandemic. I think um, we are seeing a lot more interest from sponsors, uh, like very recently this year, in coming back to our esports, a lot of new sponsors coming in. So I expect while we've been pretty flat over the past three years, we're gonna see some growth in sponsorship, but digital revenues have grown a lot more than what we expect sponsorships uh, to grow. Um, we've introduced new products like Hall of Legends, we have the Global Emote program that's launching, um, we're working on other products with Paul's team as well uh, to deliver around our international events. So we will see dramatic growth rates. We have, we've continued to see, and this is one of the reasons why, sorry, I'll pause, I'll pause. And I'll get into the second part. Let them do their work. Oh, you can keep going. I it's keep a going. challenge, okay. let's go. So this is one of the reasons why we changed our business model, the foundation of our business model from sponsorships and media revenue to digital. In those times where sponsorships were relatively flat, digital revenues kept increasing. Now with new products, we're really seeing incremental jumps in revenues. And that combined with consolidating our professional leagues to have less teams to share revenues with, we're gonna see a um, really good revenue share with teams. Awesome. We're all good. Next one. A little short for this mic. Um, hi. Hi, this is uh, Jay Silver with Jay Silver Presents. Uh, thank you guys so much for um, being here and speaking with us. Uh, my question is for Chris, and Chris, I missed you. we missed you at uh, Los Angeles, so I'm glad to see you here. Um, I have a question about the two new rebrandings, specifically with the LCP and the LTA. With these new regions that are emerging, there are some teams that have left the organizations and their fans are disheartened, possibly just frustrated that the teams have left and now they're left homeless without a team to root for. So my question for you is how can you assure that these fans are seen, heard, and recognized, and how can you help them, uh, how can you promise them to have a positive experience with these two new regions? Yeah, I, I think uh, we spent a lot of time with the regional, first of all, I missed being in LA, uh, so thank you for saying that. I, I had a family conflict, but the games were great and I watched them. Um, so I, I think we've worked really hard with the regional teams uh, in both Southeast Asia and the Americas on how they're going to transition those leagues and reach the fans who may be frustrated not only about, you know, in some cases, uh, their favorite team not being in the league anymore, uh, but potentially even just about the fact that we made changes overall. 
Change is hard. Um, we, we get that. Uh, I think there's a couple of pieces, right? One is like if you, and they're different in both leagues. And I promised David to try to keep it short so Shox doesn't have to yell at me again. Uh, in, the, in the LCP, I think you're going to see really amazing inter-regional rivalries start to develop um, across all the countries that are playing there. And we're hoping that if you are a fan, for example, of a team in Vietnam who is not moving on, that you can find a home with the, with the teams from Vietnam that were included, right? You can be a Wales fan, you can be a GAM fan. Um, and you can find that national pride as they go to play teams from, from other, other countries in the region. When you look at the LTA, I think you're gonna see, and I think we saw a little bit of it in, in Worlds Play-In, um, I think you're gonna see really incredible like nationalistic rivalries form between Brazilian fans, Latin American fans, and North American fans. And I hope that uh, if you are a fan of a team that has left, you're able to find a home with a new team. Like a lot of those pro players are sticking around, they're moving to new teams, and I think that our existing brands and our remaining brands are really desperate to take the message they have um, and the fun that their fans are having and invite, invite more fans into the tent. But I can tell you the, the regional teams are always listening. Um, you know, Piotr and Bon in, in the LCP and uh, Carlos and Mark Z in the LTA, super eager to engage with fans and to find ways to make sure that they're continuing to connect week after week. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, just as a clarification, the English questions are being translated, which is no prerogative to go any longer on the answer, but I, I, I love the answer. Thank you for that, Chris. Uh, Ashley? I'm short. <laughs> um, again, thank you so much for being here and keeping an open conversation with the media outlets as well as press. I apologize because this question will be long, but I just wanted to provide enough context. It has been a well-celebrated annual tradition to release music videos for every world championship. However, 2024's heaviest the crowns reception was perhaps more divided based on recorded statistics, especially for the LCK and the LPL audience. In terms of storytelling, in terms of the accuracy of depiction of our beloved players, in terms of the relatively screen time of the players based on um, things that are very public on YouTube comments and etc. And we of course understand that creative outcomes will vary in results and reception due to so many differing factors, some of them random. But what is Riot's understanding on the reception of the heavy of the crown? Why do you think that this situation has perhaps occurred? If you can provide us an insight and what are some of the measures that you are planning to take in order to possibly mitigate similar division in reception in future Worlds videos? Thank you so much. I'll take it. I'm waiting for a translation. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're super happy with the video. Um, we're getting record viewership of the video. Uh, we understand that, that, that fans will have a different reaction creatively to what we do. Music is a very important part of the game experience. And um, you take risks when you work with bands. We love Linkin Park. We're going to have an amazing opening ceremony tomorrow. We like the video. We always learn from feedback from our community. So we will take that in, and, and we will use that when we go to produce next year's Worlds video. So thank you for the feedback. Um, not a feedback from my side, but No, no, no. General. I'm saying generally to fans. OK, cool. Thank you. We so learn. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, this is Florian Merz from Sport1 in Germany. Um, as a longtime fan of League of Legends, I'm really looking forward to see you guys coming back to more than just two international events. And I have two questions in this regard. How did you come up with the name of First Stand? And what did you make to choose the aforementioned format for that? Uh, we spent a lot of time on the name, to be, to be totally honest with you. Um, I think at the end of the day, we wanted to, to find something that felt uh, really uh, really attached to League of Legends, the game, as opposed to just giving it the, you know. I, I, I came in and said, let's just call it season kickoff event. We've already done it once. We've got the branding for it. Everyone knows what it is. It'll be good. The creative types told me I was crazy. Um, they came back with lots and lots of options. We spent a lot of time kind of crossing stuff off and circling things and having a bunch of conversations. Ultimately, I think we wanted to reflect something that, uh, 
felt really good in terms of a tournament. Like every region is going to carry a tournament uh, into, into first stand. So to us, it feels like one big tournament that's just starting in five different places and, and ending at the end. Um, first stand, when we looked at all of, the, all of the options we had in front of us, was the one that the team looked at and said, like, yes, this feels, this feels really good for us. Uh, in terms of format, we'll, we'll talk in a lot more detail at the, at the start of the season. But uh, the goal for us really is if you look at uh, first stand has five teams, MSI has 10, Worlds has 17, but it's really one from each region, two from each region, three from each region. We wanted to build uh, as we went. Uh, the real two kind of things we built first stand on is we want to see every team play every team at that event. Um, so if you're, uh, if you're a, an LTA fan and an LEC fan, you will get to watch those two teams play each other guaranteed. You don't have to worry about draws or, or anything. They will play, and they'll play in a best of series. Uh, the second thing is we really wanted to focus on uh, kind of uh, taking risks with, with competitively. So Fearless Draft is, is where we landed for 2025. Uh, we are deep at work uh, on our competitive ops side for what 2026 can look like. Um, there may be a world where we have a different sort of competitive format for that first split. We think it's a great opportunity for us to take some chances to do something that helps stretch teams and pros, and that's super entertaining for fans. Awesome. Thank you, and thank you for having us. Vielen Dank, Florian. Viel Spaß noch. Awesome. So we'll get LEC versus LTA. Let's go. Okay. All the things. Go ahead. Um, hi guys, first of all, thank you for your time. I'm Theo from Sons of Guys and Lagic Wave from Americas. I wanted to ask uh, John, now with the uh, announcement of the LTA, it's the second uh, Riot Games competition in which uh, Latin America and North America have merged uh, following the VCT Americas. So I wanted to ask you if this can um, higher, higher up the opportunities of having a major event in uh, Latin America and countries different than Canada, the US, or Mexico, but not only on League of Legends and Valorant, but also on Team Fact Tactics or the following to XKO. Yeah, look, I, I, we have been to Mexico. We did a stage of worlds in Mexico City <clears throat> last year. 22. 22, two years ago. And we had an amazing response from fans. We love our fans uh, in Latin America. I think like similar to what Chris said, now that we have different grades of international events, that gives us more opportunities to go to markets that are a little bit smaller. Um, so stay tuned. Yeah, I hope we get there. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Aaron Down from PC Games N here. First of all, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. and. Uh, Thank you for bringing Worlds to our ends. It's uh, very much overdue, I think. Um, first one, just a really quick one for Paul. I mean, I'm personally really excited. I'm sure many people are here for the Bridge of Progress uh, to come in, finally seeing a bit of a shakeup in the era and map Paul a little bit there. But uh, I just wanted to know if this was just kind of like the start for perhaps bringing in new maps or sort of skins for the maps in the game, uh, something that you guys want to sort of explore a little bit more long term. Um, and the second question, well, I'll answer that one just to give you guys a little bit of time to think. We have obviously, as you've said, uh, just celebrated, you know, 15 years of league, which is a remarkable, remarkable achievement, especially uh, considering you see so many games nowadays, even AAA titles sort of launch and then falter. So for the three of you, I got to ask, you know, what it is for each of you what you feel is the magic, what it is that you feel has allowed League to persist for this long, and sort of how that means to you. So let's start with the Bridge of Progress ARAM stuff. We're very excited to bring this moment to everybody to kind of experience a piece of the arcane experience in the game. It very much the show was inspired by the game, and the game inspires the show, so we have this kind of loop that uh, creatives feed off each other for it. So I'm personally very excited, and I worked on the Bilgewater event many years ago where we brought Butcher's Bridge uh, you know, as an experience. So I'm a big fan of finding ways to bring those thematics to, to, our, to our mode so that players can feel uh, feel it a bit differently each time. Now, whether we will continue to do that, we shall see. Uh, there is technology that may enable uh, us to have more capability, but I cannot confirm anything. But let's just say uh, I like these things, 
So I would love to talk to my team more about it. Uh, and they're going to punch me in the face now. But uh, so we shall see. But I, I think uh, we'll, the, we'll see what happens with this version that's coming out. Um, and then I'll let the, the whole crew start answering the second question. Well, wait till Shox tells us we mm -hmm. can talk. Yeah. Go ahead. You What's can, that? You can go. I got it. Okay, yeah. Go. Um, so, uh, you know, my job now is basically managing all the around game experiences around our core games. And, you know, our games at Riot, uh, at their core, they're competitive games. So they're going to have, I think, a lot more longevity than normal out of the box games because every game's different depending on who you're playing in the mix of champions or agents um, that are competing against one another. But Riot invests more in its players than any other publisher out there. We do that with this event, with Worlds and with eSports. We do it with music. We do it with animated TV shows like season two of Arcane that's about to come out. And um, that just speaks, I think, to the depth of the experience we want to deliver to our players. And it matters, I think. It, it, this is where we try to elevate our players to become fans of our game. And we do it with all these levers around these great games that we make. So I think that, more than anything, is added to the longevity of League. And it will happen with Valorant and 2XKO and all of our other games as well. I think being able to update a game every two weeks for 15 years is an incredible mm -hmm. accomplishment. I think it makes the game feel incredibly fresh, even if you now, when I get home from, from Worlds, like not playing very much now, but when I get home from Worlds and I'm back to my PC, the game will be different than when I left it, right? So there's always something to get better at. There's always something to master. Um, and like, you know, there's always something that pulls you back. Um, and, and that to me is why so many folks, even folks who have left League for some amount of time, always find their way back because it's, it's really, you know, it's really hard not to, honestly. Oh, wait, I'll do this one. This, one's, this one means a lot. To, this question means a lot to me because it's been such a part of my life mm -hmm. for so long. I mean, I've been working on the, I mean, I started working on this game in 2006, right? So that's almost 20 years. And to think that a, a, the idea of the game, that a game could evolve and last for this long is, is pretty unique and rare and I think special. And I think it's not the time that makes it special. I think it's the ability for it to forever change. We alluded, to, we said it, like we, we patch every two weeks. That was something new a long time ago. And I think what, what it allows us to do is continue to evolve it to meet what players tell us and need it to be. That, that relationship, that cycle is super special to keep it fresh. But also just to go, well, how do we adapt to what people need as they move on with different phases of their life? I was talking to someone today about a family who plays games with their children, and they will continue to do that. The fact that you can bring and come up together, like as a squad, you know, make sure your mom covers your mid, your dad covers jungle, uh, and like you know, your your kids are the top laners, and maybe your your crazy uncle is is filling right. That that's that's that brings people together, right? And that 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 coordination of play, those those experiences where like you come back from impossible odds when you didn't think it was gonna happen or you do an unconventional pick. The game has infinite ability for you to kind of continue to experiment. And I think that combination of, of, of experiences that you can play with your friends or your family and continue to discover things just makes it feel like something we can iterate for, forever. And like that's, that's incredible. So my hope is we continue to do that for as long as players will, will continue to do it and we're gonna be there to do our best to serve it, and that is truly incredible. All wonderful answers, thank you very much. Wow, oh Paul, what an answer, I've got goosebumps. Also, okay. tomorrow, right, it's also the same thing, it's about yeah. who's gonna pick what, is it gonna right. be a pike from Caria, is it gonna be so back and forth, I love that, thank you so much. Of course. Um, All right, this will be the final question for this session. So if I follow. <laughs> Hello, uh, this is Pedro from Sentinela in Mexico. Um, my question is uh, for John or Chris. Uh, how is going to be the strategy to build communities or have the closer communications with the LTA, especially with the LLA fans that are going to be on, on no lands, uh, with the teams as a light in the middle of nowhere, and maybe they need an ABC to view this new product? Yeah, I can. Yeah. So um, thank you for the question. 
Uh, I think the team has spent a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, there's, I think you, it, their sort of first piece is, is they've attacked it, and I, I hate speaking for them, but again, they're up there, they'll throw stuff if I get it wrong. Uh, it's to make sure that we're looking, we're not looking at Latin America, right? There's a lot of countries in there, there's a lot of cultures in there, there's a lot of really dedicated, incredible sports fans there uh, that I think we want to make sure that the LTA is able to connect with. So the first part of that, I think, is, is something that we're going to lean into the teams to do, to help take pro players, to help take brands, and to be able to reach out to fans, whether they're in Mexico, whether they're in Peru, whether they're in South America, in, in Argentina or Chile, and find a way to connect more directly with them. I think the second thing, and it, it came through the uh, LTA's announcement video, uh, is that they are looking for ways to bring more of their events, not just to San Paulo in LA, but to begin to look at the entire region uh, as some place where they want to be able to deliver uh, direct fan experiences, whether it's road shows on one end or uh, viewing parties on the other. But I, I think community building is is top of the top of the priority chart for them, uh, and they're going to that team is going to continue to work to make sure that. LLA fans feel like they have a home in the LTA and that they don't have to tune into leagues in, in other regions if they don't, if they don't want to, um, to, to find something that feels like a really great League of Legends esports experience for them that they can connect to. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Muchas gracias. Um, we are almost done, uh, but there are some very special guests that are getting set up as well. So I will ask you a few questions if that's okay. This is when the grilling begins. No, I'm kidding. I know you never wage your predictions, right? Is that correct? Is that still the case? Like you never like give your prediction? Your prediction? I, I, I like you would? predictions. Okay, go ahead. And uh, also, and why, of course? Yeah, this is yeah. dangerous. No, it is dangerous. Yes. But uh, <laughs> look, I, watching T1 all year, it's been a pretty amazing ride. They almost didn't make it to Worlds this year, and their performance during Worlds has been amazing. Um, so, you know, if I had to pick one of the two, I would pick T1. Okay, it's on record. I, I'm predicting five games. Nice. And whatever <laughs> happens from there is, is up to the League of Legends gods. It's true. Paul, do you have any thoughts on the matter? I just want to hear silver scrapes. Yeah, same, same. Uh, I think last year, uh, although it was like, it was an incredible moment in Korea, seeing T1 win as well, I would have loved for it to be five games. We'll see if it is today. Um, Chris, may I, may I ask you, having been in Chengdu myself for MSI, and it, it was really, really awesome, but what were kind of the qualities that, that made you want to revisit that city now for a world final? Yeah, uh, I think we had uh, an incredible fan turnout for, for all the matches in MSI. MSI is a long run, uh, and there was no day in the venue where we felt like the fans in the region just didn't bring an incredible amount of excitement and energy. Uh, I think the other like, really big piece for us was how great uh, the local officials in Chengdu were to work with. Uh, they were incredibly welcoming, incredibly hospitable. Uh, bringing a big event anywhere uh, is really difficult. Like, I think you'll see in, in all the success we've had in worlds in Europe, it's because of our uh, incredible uh, relationships with the city of Berlin, the city of Paris, the city of London. Uh, and I think our success at uh, MSI this year came from our relationship with the city of Chengdu. So we're really excited to be able to go back there uh, to leverage those relationships and you know, kind of a lot of the learnings we picked up when we were there this year. Awesome. Uh, it was great. It was a great experience, a great fan experience as well. Uh, great hot pot, too. Great hot pot. That's we had correct. it almost every night. It was, uh, it was crazy. Um, we will have Lincoln Park joining us in just a little bit, and it's been wonderful seeing, um, you know, people get really hyped about the song. I know I've heard it a lot because it's in the broadcast a lot, of course, and it's been a pleasure. And I'd love to know if any of you had ever, were you like a Lincoln Park fan when you were a bit younger, or are you a newer fan, or are you familiar with their work? I love Lincoln Park. <laughs> so yeah, I was a huge fan. I was very excited to hear that they were coming back and that we could be a part of it. Yeah, same. Uh, when they told me that this was going to be a thing, I was like, what the? All right, sounds <laughs> awesome. Let's go. Yeah. And the track was just perfect yeah. for our the anthem. Was great. Yeah, it's yeah. lovely. I, I take the nerding one step further. So Mike Shinoda also had a side project called Fort Minor yeah. that I was also an enormous fan of. So for me, it, it really brought a lot of things together. But Linkin Park, big part of my growing up. So fantastic. Yeah. Um, can you say something about um, you know, how important 
uh, the fact is that the song has turned into kind of a, a, a pop culture phenomenon, right? And when you realize that it has shifted, because this has happened for a very, very long time, and there are some super memorable moments at that, but I feel like in the last couple of years, it's really taken the whole world by storm, not necessarily just people who are already a fan of League of Legends. I mean, it's pretty humbling when that uh, happens. I think all we intended to do was, was create something that spoke to, you know, uh, honoring the competition, honoring the moment, and uh, the partnership was organic and natural, and the fact that that's the result is just something you can only kind of dream of, but I don't think you can go in intentionally hoping for that. It just, if the magic's there, it's there, and we're just lucky that it's turned into that. We have an incredible music department. Yeah. You'll, yeah, I mean, you'll get to see Maria in a little bit, but um, they do just a great job going out and finding artists that we want to work with. And every year we seem to hit with a big artist um, really helping us amplify this great event that we do. So, yeah, like Paul said, it's super humbling and fun to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think the journalists will probably be a little tilted that I'm up here now asking questions when they could have asked, so I'm gonna ask a critical one, if I may. Uh, I am from, uh, the e from EU, from the LEC, and obviously there was a lot of hubbub about um, having uh, the LEC studio be kind of the Swiss stage. Now, as someone who, who broadcasts herself, that was very comfortable in order to produce what we wanted to produce. We know the studio very well. We know uh, its limitations and its abilities, and we're used to working it in its entire year. But in the same vein, I can also understand if there were some fans that said, well, I've been here a couple of times already this year, right? Is there anything uh, you could say about that process? Yeah, uh, I'm happy to it. put a few, yeah, I mean. Uh, first of all, like, who let you ask the hard questions? You're just supposed to be throwing softballs, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, being in the Berlin studio, in addition to kind of all the things you pointed out, um, does allow us in certain ways to go bigger in other places. Uh, so I think you'll see the spectacle around our finals in O2 really lent, uh, you know, we were able to borrow a lot from, from the Swiss stage. Uh, with that said, uh, when we're in a better position to talk about next year, um, I think you'll see that Swiss is in a slightly larger venue um, as, we, as we go into next year. Uh, and as we look into the future, like, I think it's going to be an interesting balancing act for us to figure out like, how do we right size each, each round so that the tournament continues to feel bigger and better every year. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we're, we're giving due attention to, to each, each round. So we, we're spending a lot of time with our events team, our content services team, kind of looking through what the, what the future can hold around, around that stage. Awesome. Hope uh, I didn't just get perfect. myself fired, but I guess no, John. That's perfect. Yeah, okay, that's perfect. I'm sorry. Um, we won't keep you any longer. Um, we will take a quick break before we get back, and then we will have our fireside chat with Lincoln Park. So a short break, you can get a refreshment, but hang around. We'll tell you uh, the second that we're going to be starting again. We'll give you some time, of course. So thank you very much for listening to this first part, and we'll see you very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.